This is the story of Johnny King. More precisely, it's my story of Johnny King. I'm not a Tramir Rover supporter, at least not in its truest sense. My first encounter with Tranmere was as an opposition supporter at the age of nine, when they came to Villa Park with a 3-1 advantage in the semi-final of the 1993-94 Football League Cup, then sponsored by a plucky young soft drinks concern by the name of Coca-Cola. Villa ended up winning that remarkable tie on penalties, and went on to win the final, thus claiming the first of two trophies I've ever seen my team win. Three, if you count a playoff win. I don't. I had no idea that their manager was one of English football's great characters. And I had no idea that I would pass his statue years later on the way into Prenton Park as a de facto home supporter. My dad's relocation to the Wirral brought Tranmere into my life. It brought us a long list of shared experiences, chief among them Tranmere's promotion back into the Football League in 2018. Neither of us can claim to be proper Rovers supporters, but there we were at Wembley cheering them through that playoff final there and our second attempt in a row, like it was the only thing that mattered in the world. Liam Ridehouse's red card and James Norwood's winning goal are moments that will stay with me forever. These shared experiences matter. In a very real sense, that incredible match against Boreham Wood replaced Tranmere's loss to Aston Villa as my favourite ever football match. There are significant figures whose presence has touched both clubs. Brian Little became Villa's manager not too long after that epic Coca-Cola Cup tie and had been a one-club player at Villa Park. He, more than anyone else, was passed down from generation to generation through Villa folklore. My dad's told me stories about a great many Villa legends and we've seen a fair few together. Little is in a league of his own as far as my dad's concerned and it's easy to see why. But Newcastle-born Little has been anything but a one-club manager. A few years after leaving Villa... Having won the second of those Coca-Cola Cup finals in 1996, he was appointed as the manager of Tramway Rovers. There, he took a relegation-threatened Division 2 team to 8th place, having taken over in October 2003, and they reached the last eight of the FA Cup for good measure. The next year, Little and Tramway finished third in the division and lost in the playoffs. But by the start of 2006, they were in trouble, and relegation was a possibility. Manager and club parted ways at the end of the season. Another name that looms large over the history of Aston Villa is Tom Waring, a prolific goalscorer for the club between the wars. Known to one and all as Pongo, Waring scored 159 goals in 216 league games for the Villa. That's the kind of record that makes a name famous forever. Of course, to a child like me, learning about my club's history, Pongo Waring was a name and some numbers. He passed away four years before I was born. His ashes were scattered in the whole tent penalty area. That's the kind of name Pongo wearing is at Villa. It was only later that he became three-dimensional in my imagination, as an enigmatic, training-shy maverick with curious habits and a deadly eye for goal. And he was a Birkenhead lad, born in what was then the district of Higher Tranmere. He began his career at the club, before signing for Villa in 1928 and scoring at that phenomenal rate. He returned to Prenton Park in 1936, and his late playing years took him to various Wirral clubs as the Second World War began. But my new affection for Tramway Rovers also introduced me to a man whose only connection to my club had been as an adversary, the late John King. It's quite a thing, his statue. It stands proud at the corner of Prenton Park, index fingers extended, arms raised, in what I soon learned was a trademark pose and one he'd replicated in the monument's shadow before he passed away. So he began an education into an icon. A few years on, I researched Johnny King in detail for an article I wrote for a football website. A few years more, and here I am. In this mini-series, I'll be telling the story of Tranmere's favourite son. Together, we'll follow King's famous trip to the moon in episode 2. We'll visit his destination and explore the man and his legacy in episode 3. But this first episode takes us right back to the beginning, in inner city London, on the 15th of April 1938, the day John Allen King was born. Five and a half months later, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain signed the Munich Agreement after meeting with Adolf Hitler. It was the nadir of Chamberlain's policy of appeasement, and it sealed Nazi Germany's annexation of the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia. Hitler had indicated that this region was the end of his territorial aggression, and the Munich Agreement was an attempt to avoid war in Europe. History paints a very different picture. 
King's father, a cowman who turned over his herd to become a chauffeur, wasn't about to experience the full horror of the capital at war. At the beginning of the Blitz, a relentless and devastating eight-month Luftwaffe bombing campaign over Britain, the Kings left London and headed north for Merseyside. Little did they know that their toddler, John, would become one of the Wirral's most admired people. He trained as a plumber before answering football's call on the blue edge of Stanley Park. King played for Everton in the first division of the Football League between 1957 and 1960, making his debut at the age of 18. And in 1960, a brief spell away from Merseyside etched another King connection into my own past. I grew up in Bournemouth on England's south coast and regularly watched AFC Bournemouth at Dean Court. Although trips to Villa Park were frequent, much of my early football education came courtesy of the Cherries. When they signed King, Bournemouth were in the newly national third division and the manager was Don Welsh. Six years earlier, he'd become the first manager in half a century to be relegated with Liverpool. Everton were promoted into the first division on the very same day. King only played around 20 times for Bournemouth as they lumbered their way to the first of a couple of mid-table finishes and Merseyside came calling once more. He signed for Tranmere Rovers and played more than 250 times, captaining the team for seven of his eight years at the club. In truth, he never really left. But it wasn't all plain sailing for this nautical analogy-loving skipper. He'd been signed by Walter Galbraith, who sought to invest in his playing staff in order to avoid relegation. He spent in vain, and left Tranmere after 11 months. Rovers were relegated to the 4th Division in 1961. King made his league debut in an away win over Shrewsbury Town in February, and started every Division 3 game for the remainder of the season. Tranmere struggled for consistency, and were eventually relegated in 21st place. It was under a new manager, Dave Russell, that the road back to the third tier began. Russell was a Scot, from Dundee, who was relegated from and then promoted to the second division with Berry, and dropped down two divisions to take over after Galbraith's ill-fated and short-lived reign. He managed Rovers for eight years and moved aside in 1969 to make way for Jackie Wright, his coach. Russell became Tranmere's general manager and stayed at the club until 1978. He passed away in June 2000 in Birkenhead at the age of 86. Together, Russell and Captain King righted the Rovers' ship in the 60s. The manager shifted away from the focus preferred by his predecessor, drafting in a number of youth players, as well as some shrewd free transfers from outside. They finished 15th in their first season in the 4th Division, during which King missed just four league matches and began clawing their way back up the division, finishing in 8th, 7th, 5th and 5th. King was a consistent presence throughout. But when they finally succeeded in 1967, he didn't start a league match until the end of December. His return came in an away loss at Luton Town, after which the familiar problem of inconsistency ensured that promotion wouldn't be easy. But they finished fourth, and were promoted along with Barrow, rivals Southport and champions Stockport County. A run of four wins, over Newport County, Wrexham, Port Vale and Crew Alexandra, has been just the job in spite of Rovers winning fewer matches than they had in each of the previous two seasons. A year later, King left Merseyside once more, signing for Port Vale back in the 4th Division, after his Rovers Bower Orient in May 1968. Another player might have been on the move again after just one month. Vale played a friendly against Brian Clough's Derby County, and King so impressed old Big Ed that he tried to sign the former Tranmere wing half. A man of integrity, King instead elected to honour the agreement he'd made in signing for the 4th Division club. So the story goes, Clough's attention then shifted to Tottenham Hotspur's Dave Mackay, one of his most famous signings and a man later named somewhat ambitiously by Clough as the greatest player Spurs have ever had. No wonder he and Peter Taylor personally took on the apparently tricky task of persuading him to move to the baseball ground. Mackay shared the accolade of Football Writers Footballer of the Year after his first season at Derby, during which he was a vital influence from a position of sweeper. Derby were promoted to the First Division and the rest is history. Meanwhile, Port Vale captain Johnny King was a defensive mainstay during their own promotion season in 1969-70 under manager Gordon Lee, another former Villa man and later the manager of Everton. His performances at Vale Park attracted some flattering comparisons. Port Vale historian Phil Sherwin described him as a great player alongside Royce Broson in a Gordon Lee side that was built on defence. He was tigerish, said Sherwin. He was a great foil for Roy. 
He would be the one heading the ball away and Johnny would mop things up and put his foot in where necessary. He was our knobby styles. King's tackling also earned him a comparison to Norman Hunter from another Vale fan. Styles, Hunter and King. Those are three players I certainly wouldn't want to have been tackled by. Sadly, promotion in 1970 was the end of King's playing career in any meaningful sense. In the autumn of that year, he chipped a bone in his ankle and missed the next four months of football. The following summer, he signed for non-league Wigan Athletic, and just 12 appearances later he retired, his eye-catching excellence arguably underexposed by a career spent bouncing between the third and fourth tiers. Still, there's plenty to be said for loyalty, and even after years as captain, and with a solid promotion success under his belt, King's relationship with Tranmere Rovers was just getting started. The newly retired chauffeur's son coached at Tranmere for a time and was eventually given his first opportunity in management by the Wirral Club. He was appointed in April 1975 to replace his boss, the manager Ron Yates, with Rovers well on the way to being relegated out of the third division. But the end of the season hinted at better times to come. Tranmere were unbeaten in their last four matches and won the final three games at Prenton Park. Their yo-yoing continued thanks to promotion under King in the 1975-76 season. His progress in the bottom tier was such that he was recommended for a vacancy at Sheffield Wednesday by the great Bill Shankly. King scotched the suggestion, astutely noting that he didn't have enough experience. Sadly, financial realities then hit home. Key players were sold and not replaced in the third division, and King was unable to prevent the inevitable. Rovers were relegated once more in 1979. The fledgling manager was sacked and replaced by Brian Hamilton. King took a coaching role at Rochdale for a while before dropping into non-league to continue with his managerial career. He enjoyed a good deal of cup success at Northwich Victoria. In 1983, they reached the final of the FA Trophy, only to lose to Telford United, and they went one better a year later. They needed a replay at the Victoria ground against Bangor City, but bagged the trophy in 1984, as well as the Cheshire Senior Cup. It's a curiosity of King's career that these Cups, two of only three trophies he would ever win, have been overshadowed by promotions and Cup runs and near misses that didn't deliver silverware. King left Northwich that summer and found himself in Wales in 1985. He was appointed as the manager of Carnarvon Town, with the Canaries at that time in the English league system. They would be one of a batch of teams that moved into the newly formed League of Wales in 1992. He's regarded as one of their most successful managers, thanks in no small part to a fabulous FA Cup run in 1986-87. King led them to their best ever performance in the competition, and a famous second round victory. The journey began in the first qualifying round against Marine, overpowered on the overall sloping pitch thanks to goals from Austin Salmon and Steve Craven. They both scored again, to add to teenager Stuart Clinch's strike in a 3-1 win at Winsford United in the second qualifying round. Carnarvon were away again in the third qualifying round, a 4-1 victory over Eastwood Town, and for the 3-2 win against Chester Street Town, that secured a place in the first round. By the time Stockport travelled to Gwynedd for their partially uphill battle at the Oval, they were in the midst of a remarkable game of managerial musical chairs that came close to pulling in King himself. He decided not to apply for the Stockport job that was filled, vacated, and then filled again by Colin Murphy who even managed to coach under Bob Houghton in Saudi Arabia between his October resignation and his November reappointment. They were also bottom of the 4th division and staring non-league in the face, and unfortunately for the Hatters, non-league arrived early and knocked them out of the FA Cup. Salmon was on the score sheet again, in a 1-0 win that was marred by crowd trouble. Pitch invasions by Stockport supporters led to an investigation by the Welsh Football Association into the effectiveness of the stewarding on the day. Despite being cleared, Carnarfon would build for a significant financial contribution to the investigation. Chairman Arthur Roberts immediately resigned in protest, but the Canaries were on the crest of a wave. With 4th Division opposition dismissed, 3rd Division opponents were waiting in the second round. And they too had to come to the Oval. In December, York City did what Stockport couldn't and left Carnarfon with a clean sheet. The 0-0 draw set up a replay at Bootham Crescent three days later and set the scene for the most noteworthy win in Carnarvon's history. Just as they had at the beginning, strikers Salmon and Craven scored the goals that saw their team through. York had been confident ahead of the replay. Manager Dennis Smith was pleased with his team's thoroughly good professional performance at the Oval, and lamented the chances they'd missed in a game they rarely seemed likely to lose. 
Smith's circumspect comments about the hardy non-league side that beat them in the replay were soon replaced by rather less enlightened words from another part of Yorkshire. The third round draw pitted Carnarfon against second division Barnsley, managed by Alan Clark. His view on non-league participants in the FA Cup was scathing. All they do, he said, is deprive full-time outfits of much-needed revenue and get my fellow managers the sack. Clark's paymasters had no such decision to make. A bumper crowd of more than 2,500 packed the oval for another impressive nil-nil draw, but this time the replay was a game too many. A Roger Wilde goal sealed a 1-0 win for Barnsley and removed another non-league obstacle from the FA Cup, presumably to Clark's delight. The Canaries were also having a fine season in the multi-part league, but in April they had to deal with the departure of King, whose destiny had come back over the horizon. Tranmere were in trouble, and in administration, and their saviour guided them into uncharted waters. Next time, on One Johnny King. One Johnny King was written and produced by me, Chris Nee, for Sphinx Football. My thanks and acknowledgement to the people whose work has informed this episode along with my own, namely Ryan Ferguson and Planet Prentonia, Port Vale historian Phil Sherwin, and Gil Upton and Steve Wilson, the authors of Tramir Rovers 1921-1997, a complete record. Visit sphinxfootball.com for all of our podcasts.